Hi, welcome to Language and Film, where we cog the true true about to smart some ways they be yabbering and yarnies. Cloud Atlas is one of the most painful viewing experiences I have ever endured voluntarily more than once. And the problem is that it doesn't realize it's a terrible movie. It considers itself high art, concerned with tackling only the most profound existential and philosophical questions. It's not content to be a bad movie. No, Cloud Atlas is an ambitious film. In this 2012 interview with the AV Club, writer-director Lana Wachowski describes it as the most experimental tonal structure in the history of cinema. In the same interview, the word art, or one of its derivatives, is used 25 times. Wachowski then goes on to compare herself and her sibling co-director to Charles Dickens, Victor Hugo, and Herman Melville. And if you disagree with that and still think that Cloud Atlas is just a bad movie, well, then you are one of those critics who, as soon as they encounter a piece of art they don't fully understand, they reject it just out of some gulf between what they expect they should be able to understand and what they understand. In layman's terms, if you find this movie to be a bloated disaster of third-rate dialogue and narration instead of on a par with classics like Moby Dick, Les Miserables, and Homer's Odyssey, well, then it's due to your vast chasm of misunderstanding. The movie itself even references Melville for this very reason. Never forget Herman Melville writes a ripping yarn about a big white whale which is summarily dismissed, and yet today... And in the next breath takes a stab at the professional art critic. What is a critic but one who reads quickly, arrogantly, but never wisely? And it's supposed to be hilariously ironic that an author's book becomes successful once he throws a critic who wrote a bad review of it to his death. But this scene never sat right with me. I didn't laugh the way the movie told me I should. And I think it's because I was already starting to realize that Cloud Atlas, the film, is a total crime against language and film. Listen, I tried to like this movie, okay? Theoretically, it should be amazing. I mean, it's based on a best-selling and respected literary novel. It's directed by not one, but three esteemed contemporary directors. You've got an enormous cast of recognizable and fantastic actors. It looks gorgeous, it spans hundreds of years, and to give credit where credit is due, it's only one of a handful of science fiction movies I've seen that attempts to address what language will look like in the future and takes the effort seriously. Nay, this life of rod and luck ain't no smiley some yawning. I'm a linguistics nerd, remember? And so the highlight of this film for me is the future English spoken on the big island of Hawaii hundreds of years in the future. I have set out several times to make a video about this cool feature of Cloud Atlas. But alas, all my efforts get diverted. So my plan to thoughtfully discuss the details of this future English has devolved into this a cathartic rant regarding how miserable this movie makes me feel. There is just so, so much wrong with this movie that any glimmer of genius is absolutely drowned out by a torrent of terrible creative choices. Let's start with a quick recap of the plot. Oh wait, there can be no such thing, because this movie jams no less than six main storylines into a convoluted mess. That's about five storylines too many for one movie. And it's completely unnecessary. Even if you wanted to convey the theme of a multi-generational spiritual connection that transcends time and space, you don't have to beat your audience over the head with six storylines all doing the same thing. Two is enough a past and present pair of stories, or present and future, or past and future. And then you connect them. That's all you need. And if you wanted to get crazy, you could have three, I suppose, a past, a present, and a future storyline. But Cloud Atlas doubles that already unwieldy amount. Why stop at six? Why not have seven, or 13, or 150? Yes, the movie is based on a book that has six storylines, but that's still no justification for including all of them. You're allowed to leave out stuff from the novel for the sake of the movie because not everything translates well. Purists may disagree with me here, but go read the book if you want all six storylines. 
Personally, I'd rather have a movie that's actually entertaining and doesn't put you to sleep with its 172 minute runtime that honestly feels like double that amount because for a lot of it, we aren't watching very much happen on the screen. So keep the most interesting storylines and cut the others. You don't need them. Because this movie is not only long, it's repetitive, like a drone in your brain that won't stop. And I will not be subjected to criminal abuse. I will not be subjected to criminal abuse. Because that's the conceit behind Cloud Atlas, after all, that all human stories are fundamentally the same, a cycle of repetitions in endless perpetuity. Just to be sure you don't miss that fact, we have the same actors playing different characters among the storylines. See, this choice might have made sense on paper. So that might sound cool, but when it actually happens, the end result is somewhat more problematic. And let's put aside any potential ethical questions that might arise from doing this and just focus purely on the visceral consequences. What ultimately happens when you try to transform a South Korean actress into an English character is that the viewer is left with the unsettling feeling that something is off. Like, it's hard enough to keep track of the overwhelming number of characters and plots to begin with. Then you compound that with having the same actors portray different characters, and you have to keep them all straight. And finally, the film attempts to transform the facial features of the actors so much that they wind up being unrecognizable. So like the first two times I watched Cloud Atlas, I had no idea that this person and this person were the same actor. I just thought, whoa, that woman looks weird. What's wrong with her? Does she have scurvy or some other weird 19th century disease? Same thing with the Neo Soul timeline in the future, where you have European and African American actors playing the South Korean characters. My honest reaction was, okay, so in the future, human beings have mutated from radiation or toxic waste, which has somehow kind of melted their faces. Like I had no idea until I started researching for this video that that's what they were going for. So that's one sort of repetition, but we also have the same circumstances befall our characters in all the stories over and over again. One group or person enslaving or coercing another. Where are you going? We're moving back east to work with the abolitionists. <laughs> what? Okay, so what this movie is saying is slavery is bad. Got it. But even if you need to be told that, one storyline is still sufficient. Also repeated are the same lines of inane, pretentious dialogue as though repeating phrases will imbue them with meaning. Fat snowflakes are falling on slate roofs. Fat snowflakes are falling on slate roofs. Like, like soldiers in Italy, they, they bring, bring in Vermont. Vermont. And by each crime. And by each crime. And every kindness. And every kindness. They birth our future. They birth our future. Oh. It's like waving a big sign that says, hey, this statement is really deep, y'all, so we're going to say it a few times really slowly with gravitas. But the problem is, this dialogue is terrible. Our lives, like quantum trajectories, are understood moment to moment, and each point of intersection suggests a new potential direction. In fact, Cloud Atlas holds my record for the worst single line of dialogue in the entire history of cinema. You have to do whatever you can't not do. Halle Berry honestly deserves an Academy Award for simply being able to deliver this line without busting out laughing. You know, you could replace the word do here with any verb and it has the same meaning. You have to see whatever you can't not see. You know, we already have a phrase in English that means what she's trying to say here, and that's, you gotta do what you gotta do. So why not just say that line instead of, you have to do whatever you can't not do. Well, it's because in Cloud Atlas, we have to say everything like it's a really deep insight into the human condition. And the Wachowskis love to do this. To take a simple statement of the obvious and have an actor say it like it's the biggest revelation in human philosophy. Like this. Yesterday, my life was headed in one direction. Today, it is headed in another. 
I mean, isn't that true for everyone? all the time, every day. It's like a horoscope prediction that is so vague it can apply to anything. You will make new friends, but you will also lose old ones. Everything that has a beginning has an end. Everything that begins must have an end? Really? You don't say? All right, and so what is this deep message that Cloud Atlas is not so subtly trying to convince us that it's saying slavery and coercion are bad, true, but that's really not the central message of Cloud Atlas. Those are rather secondary. The main philosophical idea behind this movie is, hold on to your seats because this is going to totally rock your world. Are you ready? Reincarnation. Now, this idea is not exactly a stunning new insight on the human condition. I mean, it's been around for thousands of years in the oldest religion on the planet, Hinduism, so Cloud Atlas isn't presenting us with anything groundbreaking or revelatory. This movie really thinks it is, though, presenting us with some new concept, and it's trying really hard to convince us that what it's saying is somehow going to shatter the earth. Phew, okay. I think I'm done. Thanks for letting me vent about that, guys. And let me know what you thought of Cloud Atlas. Am I just being too harsh of a critic here? Don't throw me over a balcony.